call this budget workshop to order. I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance today. Uh, <clears throat> and kind of a, a new and revealing method in which we're putting our budgets together. I hope everybody has felt comfortable in this process. And if you can see any way to improve this process, please feel free to contact me or any of the other supervisors. Uh, today we, were going, we will afford also the uh, request to speak or the public comment forum. So at that point, uh, I think we should go ahead and do that and then we'll proceed with our agenda. So we only have a few people wanting to speak. I'd like to remind the Well, I've got an idea, <clears throat> because there's only two. And what I would like, if you would like to make your comments brief this morning and call to the public, if you have any items on the entire budget, please write them out entirely, either hand them to your supervisor in your district or to Mr. Hendricks. So we have a very level playing field, everybody kind of knows what the project will be. So we have two people that would like to address the call to the public. They'll be afforded three minutes apiece. After that, if they have questions, they'll write them down and then hand them to the appropriate person. Please. Supervisor Johnson, are you online? Yes. Okay. Mr. Robinson, would you like to make your comments? Before I get started, I just want to say how I'm excited I am to see this open process. I think that's really exciting for the people of Mojave County. My name is Stephen Robinson. I'm from 3439 North Bowie Road in Golden Valley. And I think I'm going to get this, some fireworks started with this. Several months ago, I heard a rumor about some personnel issues in the county. I'm cautious about such rumors because usually someone has an ax to grind. I heard that an employee would receive a large pay increase as a reward for efforts on their supervisor's behalf. This person would be promoted to a supervisor position in, on paper only over those who are far more qualified. I suspected the rumor for several reasons. One, the job would normally have to go through a review and be posted for others to have the opportunity so it wouldn't, couldn't just be given to that one person. Second, the job chain change couldn't be justified if it were going to go through the normal HR process. Three, no one else could be allowed to apply for this position, which would violate numerous rules of human resource administration. Four, it would take the complete cooperation of several people, including the human resource director, finance director, department head, and the supervisor requesting the change. That is because no subordinate would risk their job to authorize such a reclassification, and those in charge would have the authority to justify this action and protect everyone involved. So I was surprised and dismayed when I reviewed the staff directory on the website over the Memorial Day weekend for the Development Services Department, where the rumor was specifically focused on the Flood Control Division. I found that the person with the new job title changed only since mid-May from unregistered certified engineer or unregistered engineer to floodplain program manager, Shannon Summers. Furthermore, I reviewed the new recommended new, addition, new initiatives for the flood control department in the 2014 budget, and I saw this position was reclassified to the floodplains program manager with a $33,000 raise over 75% more than previously received. Apparently others in the flood control departments were also seeing raises from $1,200 to $13,000. Now, I just know that the persons in charge of flood control are the floodplain manager and county administrator Mike Hendricks and the floodplain administrator and development services director, Nick Haunt. So it makes me wonder if the other part of the rumor I heard is true, which they met with Director Asuna and finance director Tim Coe to discuss this some three months ago. So this kind of pay administration, doesn't it open up the county to possible lawsuits and EEOC claims? 
And also, does this board want to be noted for tolerating this kind of salary and position manipulation? It just seems unfortunate that this would be done when the proper procedures to advertise this over a period of time and recruit and interview other people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. Next person to speak will be. I know there's certain rules that we have uh, uh, regarding the open public meeting uh, on the regular board agendas, but uh, what I said is if the board so chose, uh, either myself or Nick Hawk can address that when, uh, uh, from the floor if you so desire. I prefer to address it after the meeting. Yes, sir. Mr. Robinson. Next person to speak is Mike Paul Everhard. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisors. My name is Michael Eigenbrot. I am the new President and CEO of Interagency Council at 1940 Mesquite Avenue in Lake Havasu City. And uh, we are a social service organization has uh, and existed about 31 years now uh, with 26 different programs uh, countywide. These include the women's shelter in Lake Havasu called Sally's Place that is uh, d domestic violence uh, victims, of women and children, as well as the food bank, which has actually tripled in number of people we're serving since uh, last August. Uh, and a number of uh, advocacy programs that we have for the county, uh, including uh, court and felony adv advocacy, which is seven days a week, uh, as well as our crisis intervention program, which is also 24 hours a day, seven days a week, supporting another police department, fire, and uh, hospital, as well as our crisis line. We also have um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Mojave County with uh, some staff here in Kingman, hopefully more soon, and um, some in the Bullhead, Fort Mojave area. And uh, as I say, there's uh, 26 different programs that we have under our roof uh, with a budget of about $2.4 million dollars all monies are from the uh, state and uh, uh, from federal and from donations. We do not charge for the services that we provide with the exception of our offender treatment program, which is uh, court ordered, uh, where we provide um, services uh, uh, for offenders, abusers, and, uh, but everything else is free of charge, including our adult and children counseling services. Uh, we are hoping that the county can consider some funding for our programs uh, in this next fiscal year. I understand things are tough. Uh, social services are uh, hit very hard right now, as you probably know. DES has cut quite a bit of funding. And it just seems that when the economy is hard and budgets are cut is when people need it the most. So I respectfully ask you to please consider that in your budget process. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> County Administrator. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, you know, I also wish to sincerely thank the board for allowing us this opportunity to have this budget workshop. With the posting of the entire budget on the county's website and with this budget workshop, This is one more step the board has taken for greater transparency and accountability in county government, and I wish to applaud you for that. Uh, it's an incredible step. Uh, what will be presented to you today is an accumulation of hard work, coordination, and cooperation by staff and elected officials alike. At this time, I want to take the opportunity to personally and publicly thank our Sheriff Tom Sheehan, Presiding Judge Charles Gertler, County Attorney Matt Smith, our recorder, Carol Meyer, Treasurer Cindy Cox, Assessor Ron Nicholson. I also wish to thank the Clerk of the Court, Verlyn Tunnell, and our Justices of the Peace, Taylor, Huerta, Davis, and Brown, and our Constables, Bishop, Hamilton, Cobb, Crabtree, and Heaton. 
Truly, without your leadership and commitment, we could not have accomplished the level of cooperation and achievement which resulted in this superior work product that we're able to present to the board today. Lastly, in addition to all the hard work by the departments and divisions, I've got to thank my right-hand guy here, John Timko, and his personnel over at Finance for all the heavy lifting that you did and for coming up with a successful game plan that brought us to where we are today. This budget workshop is scheduled to have five components. Um, the first one was a call to the public, which we just had. And as a kickoff, I'm providing you with a very brief overview of the budget process to date. From there, John Timko will provide you with a brief financial state of the county along with what to expect in the way of scheduling for our pathway to budget adoption. This will be followed by those elected officials and department heads wishing to do so, having an opportunity to personally address the board with any comments and answer any questions which the board may have in regard to their personal budgets. And lastly, the board will have an opportunity to discuss the proposed budgets with the elected officials and with staff. As a recap of our process to date, by the end of January, Mr. Timko had prepared our revenue estimates and his staff started budget preparations. At the beginning of February, we received the assessed value for FY14 levied by the assessor. On February 15th, our internal services departments of IT, communications, janitorial, and fleet submitted their budgets earlier so that we could include them in this budget process. And during the latter part of February, Mr. Timko and I had one-on-one -on -one discussions with the Board of Supervisors to try to ascertain what their priorities were. At your March 4th meeting, the Board adopted a per parcel charge rate for special districts, and on March 6th, we held our budget kickoff meeting with all departments, distributing the bud budget packets and then also the instructions. On April 1st, budgets were due and received from all departments with financial staff working all the way through April to compile the budget requests. The first and second week in May, Mr. Timko and I met with each department to review their budget requests. By May 15th, financial staff had finalized the recommended county budgets for all departments. May 16th through the 20th, Mr. Timko and I met with each supervisor to provide a general overview of the recommended budgets. And that brings us to where we are today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Tim Coe for a State of the County. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm happy to be able to present to you today for your consideration the staff recommendation for the fiscal 2013-2014 Mojave County budget. As Mike just pointed out, this process began last January and will continue through mid-August. This is the 12th budget that I have prepared for the county and like the prior 11, it would have been impossible without the incredible assistance of my staff in the finance department, specifically Sonia Jaramillo and Donna Pugh, uh, who, uh, who make all this happen. Um, as we've discussed previously, we begin the budget process with our best effort to predict the available revenues and resources for the new fiscal year. And the budget before you has assumed no rate increases for any of the property taxes levied by the county. This is despite the fact that the assessed valuation for the county has decreased for the fourth consecutive year. To give you a little flavor for the amount of that decrease in the FY10 budget, the assessed valuation that was the basis for the primary property tax was $2,533,000,000. The assessed valuation we'll be using for this budget is $1,771,000,000, a decrease in those four years of 30%. Despite that, we are able to present a balanced budget that does not require any new tax uh, increase in the tax rate. In fact, maintaining the FY13 levy rate of 1.8196 6 as our levy rate for the primary property tax will result in a reduction of property taxes levied on the, the Mojave County citizens in the amount of $371,000. On the brighter side, a modest increase in retail sales activity during FY13 allows us to predict a modest increase of $700,000 in the state shared sales tax revenues 
This is um, over the base of 1.29 million in the FY13 budget. Fee income generated by our departments is also showing a slight increase of approximately 277,000. Now this year we have not anticipated the need for any sweeps of any of the other government funds as we have done in the past. In fact, last year that was in the amount of $980,000. Likewise, we have not included any lottery revenues as we're still uncertain as the state budget uh, has not been resolved on that issue. In summary, in the general fund, we are budgeting 1.1, almost $1.2 million less revenue in FY14 than we budgeted in FY13. This, of course, will mean a, re uh, a corresponding reduction in the amount of expenses that we can budget in order to maintain a balanced budget. And that was the challenge we faced when we directed the departments in March to prepare their budget request for FY14. We established as our top priority a 2.5% cost of living adjustment for all employees. This is because our last general pay increase was over five years ago. In order to accomplish the funding for uh, this ongoing cost, departments were instructed to submit base budgets with no increases in general fund support. We directed that new initiatives and capital equipment requests were restricted to those which were either legally mandated which were necessary for life safety issues or those which could be funded by offsetting reductions in other areas of that department's budgets. As Mike said, we had excellent cooperation from all departments and elected officials and were able to fund the 2.5% COLA in FY14 and present a balanced general fund budget with no requirement for any property tax increases. The county administrator and I have met with each of you individually to discuss the priorities you would like to have funded in this budget and during this workshop uh, other ideas may be discussed that you would have us add to the tentative budget uh, before that comes to you uh, at the first meeting in, um, in July. Uh, this is also an appropriate time if you have it for any questions you may have regarding the staff recommendation or we can continue on as you choose. Questions? Please continue. Please continue. Oh, well, that, that was kind of it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe we have some elected officials that would like to speak today. Um, John, do you have that list? I've got uh, the list right here. Our county attorney, uh, Matt Smith, would you like to? Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, Madam Clerk, Deputy County Attorney, Mr. Ekstrom, Mr. Hendricks, Mr. Timko, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm not one for glad handing or giving out comments. And uh, in the past, it hasn't always been that way. But I would have to say that it was in a very excellent budget process this year. And uh, I think you really have to commend uh, the staff, the board, our county administrator, our county finance director. When you think about the state of the economy and how most of the country's been doing, the fact that we've been able to keep a balanced budget with no furloughs like you've had to see, like unfortunately in Bullhead City, uh, where they've had city furlough days, as many as nine or 10 in a year. We haven't had any of that. Very few reduction in staff for anybody. And I think that's really a testament to the job that's been done here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and I think everybody pretty much knows what our office does, we're charged and tasked with prosecuting all felonies that occur within Mojave County. We also prosecute the misdemeanor offenses that occur in the unincorporated areas of the county. Beyond that, we're the legal advisor to the Board of Supervisors and the elected officials and department heads. We're closely with the public fiduciary and treasurer's office, uh, planning and zoning issues, a little bit of fire district representation, occasionally help out with the school districts. Um, one of the more important functions is the mental health cases, the mental health commitments, and we do adoptions for the public as well, uh, mostly uncontested, except when I'm stupid enough to stick my nose into one of these cases uh, where we're trying to terminate parental rights uh, and we have resistance. Uh, usually when somebody's been prosecuted by your office and is in prison and hasn't seen their child in years. So, 
those cases can be somewhat time consuming. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have about our department or our budget. Uh, the one thing that I was very happy about that I wanted to touch briefly on was the fact that over the years, because of the hiring freeze, we have lost three positions. We were able to replace two of those positions by using our fill the gap funds, which are discretionary funds that people in the court system, public defender's office and that get, it's a certain percentage of court fines that come to us locally and through the state. And we were able to supplant, uh, supplement our attorneys uh, for a number of years using that account, but unfortunately that money's dried up. And when we lost a very good prosecutor, who actually was one of the people that put in for the Justice of the Peace position, Victoria Stasio, and, and withdrew at the last minute to go to Phoenix, uh, we were not able to replace her. Not because we couldn't, because it was frozen, but because of the fact that the people that we were being paid for out of fill the gap funds, their jobs were in jeopardy. We just didn't have enough money. So we had to move one of those people into Victoria's slot into the general fund. So the one thing that I asked for, and I'm, I'm hoping the board will approve this because it's been approved by our county manager, our county administrator, and our county finance director, is that uh, they've agreed to allow the remaining person being paid for out of fill the gap funds. Half of that salary will be absorbed by the general budget this year and we'll still resume paying the other half. And then I believe the deal, and I'm sure Mr. Timko will correct me if I'm wrong, is that the following year that position will be absorbed by the general budget. So at some point that should enable us to be able to hire another attorney and uh, we have enough people to do the job right now. I appreciate your time and attention and being here and uh, Supervisor Johnson appearing telephonically today and I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Supervisor Angus. Just as I was looking through the budget, I noticed that you were reducing, um, is it employees in the bad check division? Yes. And, and that kind of makes sense to me, as just knowing that people don't write checks as much as they used to. So how, that, how does that work? Do you, does that money go somewhere else? Or what? You're exactly right. What we did was, we've known for a while that more and more companies, were, especially Walmart was the big one. When they went to telecheck, that really hurt our program. And we were running a neg uh, negative deficit uh, balance in that program every single month and having to take money from our fill the gap funds to pay that person's salary that was running the bad check program. So uh, that employee who's been with us for 20 plus years, Lori Wills, is now working as the assistant to Mr. Ekstrom. And on the side, she's keeping up and doing the bad check program duties as well. So we still have the program, but we did a little research, asked around the state and found out some of the counties, they had a person that was spending 25% of their time doing that, 10, 12 hours a week. Another county, it was about 20%. One county, only 10%. So uh, that's how we've real reallocated those duties. Thank but we still have a bad check program. Any other questions? Any other questions? Supervisor Johnson, do you have any questions? No, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Next on our list of dignitaries to speak, we have Berlin Tunnell, Clerk of the Court. Thank you, Chairman, Supervisors, staff. Appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I almost want to just say echo to everything that Matt Smith has said because it is all applicable to us. We appreciate so much the opportunity to be here and to be able to address you. Also appreciate the um, smooth process that we've gone through this year with the budgets. Um, also have the same issue with fill the gap and frozen positions that Mr. Smith does. However, staff wasn't so kind to me and didn't offer me the opportunity to um, take some of our fill the gap people and put them into the general fund, but we really really do need that our fill the gap funds are drying out um, We do have three frozen positions. We also have three fill the gaps that money is being depleted even as we speak in addition to the money going away our fill the gap positions are also limited in the work that they can do within our office 
So as more and more judges come and have to go back and forth to Bullhead and Lake Havasu, it's very difficult because we can't just take somebody out of one courtroom and put them into another courtroom when the judge changes from a civil case to a criminal case, that person can no longer do the work. So that's kind of got our hands tied and we would really, really appreciate, if not this year, in the future, if we can hurry up and get some of those people off of the Fill the Gap grants. And, and just for the record, I see Mr. Tim Coe nodding his head, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, our, our computers are an issue. We have to spend $750 per machine, whether that's a copy machine that's connected to the uh, network or each of our computers on our desk or our printers. $750 goes to the state for the privilege of leasing those machines. Not only do we get the machines, we get connectivity and support from them when we need it. But that money is coming from funds that are, f that are collected in other areas that were not meant for computers. Um, we're happy that the, the courts are, have machines, but we're sad that the county has machines that the county pays for, and they're great and up-to-date and brand new, and you know, they've got a great department, and wish that some of our computer monies could become, come out of general fund budgets as well. In addition to that, we also have other funding, our document storage that was created by the legislators for specific purposes, and, and we're using that for staff because we're short-staffed. Um, we have our office manager that's funded out of that. I, I mean, there's just no rhyme or reason to why an office manager of 47 people should come from funds that are relegated to document storage and preservation. So those are just little things, you know, where we feel like we've been a little bit shortchanged. Um, and, you know, we'd appreciate some consideration in the future budgets, but most especially, you know, our, our big thing is the fill the gap funds. And we really, you know, those are just getting dangerously low and we'd really like in the future, if you'd think about those and, and consider ways that we can help stop the pain and the, the carnage in that area. But once again, I really would like to take the opportunity um, to express to the board our appreciation for the process that we've gone through this year with the budget. It's been just really great. You know, we have always, in all my time, I've always lived within the budget, whatever it was that was set screaming and kicking the whole way sometimes and you know sometimes I thought Mr. Timko and I might even have blows but um, I've always lived within the budget and and that's just how I am I try not to write any hot checks at home either so but I, I appreciate the budget that's set I appreciate the consideration that's given to us but hope that in the future that we can be a little bit more more of it. So, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to ask them. I have a question. Um, why, why are the, my other person that knows them. I just wonder why are the court computers on a different contract than the county computers? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Angus, the, the court system um, is actually a division of the state uh, courts, uh, Supreme Court system, and they have a uniform computer system that is managed out of Phoenix. Uh, and for them to be able to use the, the, um, the court scheduling system and the tracking systems that they, um, the case processing systems that they use, they have to be on that system. They just have a more expensive charge process than we do. To that extent, we do, in fact, uh, pay our fair share from a general fund transfer to the, to the 605 court automation fund to help offset those costs and the cost of that department. That is a different yep. charge, Mr. Timko. Um, the 605 is different than, that's the money that we pay into that for our local court automation and IT department. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions that Kim can Mark? answer? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Any questions, Supervisor Brotherton? No. The Honorable Sheriff, Tom Sheehan. Hey, 
Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Brotherton, Angus Moss, uh, Supervisor Johnson, uh, our new county administrator, congratulations, uh, Mike Hendricks. And I echo again what everybody has said so far. It's been a, a great, it was a great process, very, uh, a lot of continuity, uh, discussion, and any issues we had, we were able to work them out. And it was very positive with, uh, uh, with Mike and with John and his staff, with OMB. Everybody was tremendous to work with, and it was, uh, let's say, relatively painless. But uh, I've got a, a small presentation here I'd like to uh, uh, put on for you. And I'm not going to go over what we did last year. I know uh, uh, Supervisor Watson and Supervisor Johnson were members of the board. Our other three members at the time were, uh, at the time, candidates. And I put on a presentation comparing us and our staffing level and funding level compared to Yavapai County with the same amount of uh, people living in an unincorporated area. We're working with about 40 deputies less. That shows that the commitment that the Mojave County Sheriff's Office, our deputies, and all our personnel have uh, to public safety in this county. And we continue to do so uh, every year, and we will continue to do so as long as I'm the sheriff. Uh, basically, this is right now our Arizona revised statutes, the powers and duties of the sheriff. Uh, of course, Mojave County, again, and this is our challenge. Uh, with the county being split by the Grand Canyon and Lake Mead, we have a tremendous logistical challenge. We have uh, stations, the main office here in Kingman, uh, substations with jails in Mojave Valley, Lake Havasu City and substations, up in Beaver Dam and Colorado City. So of course, again, it has a, uh, a tremendous effect on our ability to do our job, the distances and the travel time that we have in between the many calls for service that we have every year. Our population, again, compared to the amount of people that we serve, uh, around 80,000 people, compared to the cities and again comparing us to the cities it's it's a whole different ball game because the logistics and the distances we must have to challenge we don't have two or three miles to travel to a call for service we may have 20 miles we may have 30 miles we may have 60 miles and many many times that occurs our calls for service again comparing in the last uh, in the last 10 years we've gone up 10,000 calls for service but the same amount of personnel that we have and I think that, again, is a tremendous uh, effort on the staff of the deputies, the civilian employees, and all the supervisors of the Mojave County Sheriff's Office. And this is our uh, yearly jail bookings from 2002, 6,900 to 13,000 in 2012. Uh, with the uh, opening of the new jail a couple of years ago, uh, it, was, it certainly was needed. You see right now, uh, on any given day, we have over 500, between 500 and 550 inmates in our system now. So it's a tremendous challenge. And uh, there is no end in sight. It's, if they build it, they will come, just like uh, a field of dreams. But unfortunately, it's part of the business. Our job uh, of county government to make sure that people that commit crimes are in jail, people that need to go to trial, go to trial, and those that need to go to prison, go to prison. And some of the issues with our citations and warnings over the years, uh, uh, what has happened uh, with the advent and the lot of people moving in, of course, we are busier uh, with the amount of citations and warnings that we've had over the years. So, of course, uh, it's, it's close to doubled also. Uh, one item that I wanted to bring up today is that uh, we've got in late prior to our meeting with, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, county administrator, and the finance director and OMB about some of the issues we face on the Strip. And this has nothing to do with Colorado City. And let me bring that up briefly why I'm here. Uh, we're not sure about, we're going to get a grant uh, to continue on the patrols in Colorado City. I have heard nothing for sure. There's a possibility. But if we do, we do. If we don't, we don't. Uh, and we'll just have to work on that as it comes available, if it becomes available. But the challenge that we have is on the Strip again is it's divided east and west by Utah in the middle. We have substation Beaver Dam, we have substation in Colorado City, actually just outside of Colorado City, closer to Cane Beds and Centennial Park. And the people in Centennial Park and Cane Beds and Moccasin have appreciated the deputies being in Colorado City uh, because we've had a lot shorter response time to their areas, especially the areas that are primor primary objective are the unincorporated areas. Uh, but with the distances in between, uh, it's a challenge again. But what is happening now in the next two years, uh, Highway 15, just north of Beaver Dam, about milepost 15, there's going to be road construction 
on the bridges there. And it's going to have a tremendous impact on traffic. And it's going to be necessary that we have deputies not only on the west side of the county, but also on the east side of the county most of the time to respond to calls for service because it's going to be impossible to get there to travel that 75 miles in less than an hour and a half because of the road construction. Right now, if we leave from the west side to the east side, it's about an hour driving Code 3. And if you have to drive Code 3 through St. George, through Hurricane, uh, through the interstate, you know, it's a, it's a very dangerous situation also. Uh, also, if you have to get uh, uh, delayed or uh, detoured up through Highway 91, through Santa Clara, up north, it takes even longer. So we're going to have, over the next two years, some very difficult situations up there. So I had uh, sent over another proposal to add a couple of deputy sheriffs up to the Arizona Strip, which will be primarily on the east side for Centennial Park area, Cane Beds, and Moccasin. I met with uh, uh, Chairman Watson because it's in his district. I sent the information over, and I think it's very necessary that we look into uh, try to funding a couple of positions up there. Uh, for the next couple of years at least because we're going to have some real challenges and it's going to be a very dangerous situation with the bridges under construction there in milepost 15. Uh, one other thing I'd like to uh, uh, kind of clarify in the 2.5% uh, percent, uh, COLA, which I think is tremendous. You know, all the county employees have worked many years without uh, raises, but then again, uh, we've done real well because we haven't had furlough days, we haven't had layoffs, uh, we haven't lo had loss of uniform allowances. So everybody I think has, has cooperated and, and really bit the bullet to uh, make things work here in Mojave County. I think that's what's needed and we'll continue on uh, uh, teamwork and uh, everybody working together and not everybody worrying about their own private turf. That we're all working together, we're all elected officials, uh, we're all department heads, and everybody's job, whether it be the job of sheriff and a deputy sheriff or detention officer or someone working for the public works department, everybody's important to county government and we're all here to provide services to the citizens. Uh, back to the, uh, the COLA 2.5%, I wanted to make sure this is going to be for every employee, uh, even at the ones that are at the top of their pay scale. Is that, is that correct? Okay, because I know there was some uh, discussion about it. the people at the top of their pay range, it wouldn't move their pay range, so they might not be eligible. But we've got to make sure we reward those people that have been here for many, many years, 20, 25 years, that they're treated just as uh, fair as people that have not been here that long. So I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody has. Questions? I, I have two, if I could, um, briefly. Um, how how you do you do, Ms. Sheriff Sheehan? And did I understand your comments to say that this budget would actually enable you to fund those two positions in the strip area, two additional uh, positions? Uh, Chairman Watson, uh, Supervisor Moss, I did put in for that about a week and a half ago, so I don't know if you have it yet or not, uh, but we're, we're, the present budget right now would not be. Uh, what I'm doing is asking for the uh, funding. The, other, the issue that I have, though, as far as some of the funding is that uh, right now we estimate at the end of our budget year, the 1st of July, last day of June, we should be $118,000 under budget in our personal salary budget and about $50,000 under in our overtime budget. So uh, if that could be utilized for it, that could pick up uh, the majority of the cost of the two deputy sheriffs' uh, uh, salaries, benefits, and the uh, uh, vehicle uh, uh, service uh, fees that we have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, uh, we haven't specifically added that, but we do have enough funding to take care of that. The major uh, addition we'll need to make to this budget, and it will be done between now and the tentative budget, will be to actually put those positions on the roster and to fund the two vehicles for those new positions. Thank you. You preempted my next question. I appreciate that. Um, I have one last question for Sheriff Sheehan. I did notice, um, I'm still trying to find it on the line items, um, that there's going to be some changes to the computer systems in your vehicles. Um, are those satisfactory in order to allow you to free up man hours to be in the school parking lots and the elementary schools on a more frequent basis? Oh, uh, uh, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Moss, uh, yes it is. In fact, uh, uh, John Timko's worked tremendously with us to make sure we have these uh, necessary uh, computers in the cars. They're going to free up a lot of time. You don't have to contact dispatch by radio. You can run license plates. 
uh, you can do many, many things. So it's something we need very badly, and it's uh, going to be a great asset to us. And, and the reason I asked that was because of um, the sheriff man hours in school on school grounds or in the vicinity of the schools. Would that enable you better to be in that vicinity without having to return to headquarters to do your reports and things of that nature? Uh, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Ma, uh, certainly will. You know, we put an emphasis on schools, and I'm, I have no idea what's going to happen with the legislature this year uh, with the school uh, resource officer funding. It's Everything is up in the air. It seems like Medicaid has uh, held up everything in the legislature, so we're waiting to see. We're hopefully uh, that there's going to be additional funding this year that we can apply for to get additional officers. But uh, until that time, you know, we are stopping in the schools, and in fact, I stop in the schools myself. And even if I have to go to a trip to Phoenix, I stop in Wikiup, we run to Havasu down to Golden Shores, I hit uh, Yucca. And I think it's very important we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Sheriff. More questions? No. Sheriff Sheehan, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Honorable Charles Gertler, President or Presiding <laughs> Superior Court Judge, President Gertler. <laughs> God help us. Did you say Admiral? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, please, the Chairman, Chair, Vice Chairman Angus, Honorable Board Members, Administration, Council, and Finance Director Timco, thank you for elevating me to President. <laughs> I think, or Admiral for that matter. I'd settle. <laughs> I'm going to continue the uh, parade of elected officials and department heads that uh, are going to continue to commend uh, the board as well as administration and finance. This year's budget process was as smooth as the court has seen in decades. Uh, to put it into comparison, the um, tone that uh, County Administrator Hendricks and, and County Finance Manager uh, Tim Co placed this year as compared to last year. I, I do not believe that uh, the court budget process was complete before 5 p.m. last year. This year, uh, unfortunately, because of uh, training that the AOC had for the limited jurisdiction uh, judges, we couldn't do those um, that part of the court budget until the afternoon. If we were able to do those consistently, we would have been done by 11.35 a.m. this year. That is how smooth the process went. There was still give and take with respect to you know, whether or not you know, a particular line item should be reduced, but it was done professionally, and it was done with a amount of uh, sincerity that uh, we express our gratitude for. So we thank the board for the leadership it has provided, and we certainly like the direction that County Administrator Hendricks is, is taking us in. If uh, you recall Chairman Watson last November, you had asked, what do you, Judge, what do you think would turn around and help create uh, morale amongst county employees? And obviously the first thing out of my mouth was a, a pay raise. So the fact that uh, the county has had such great fiscal responsibility over the years and again, uh, commendation should go to uh, Mr. Timko for that. The prospect of a COLA is absolutely huge, not only for all for the court employees, but all county employees. However, the second aspect that I referenced was secure, safe, and good facilities. And again, I must commend the board and thank you for the uh, build out of the Lake Havasu courtroom that is proceeding with construction having to begin. Uh, this year, unfortunately, at the start of the budget process, I was not able to obtain any site plans or any estimates for the build-out of the Bullhead City project, but I plan on bringing that forward this year, uh, and I'm going to continue to be working with uh, Mr. Hendricks and Mr. Timko with respect to a new courthouse. And, and I think that uh, it must be pointed out that with all the increases that Sheriff Sheehan has referenced with respect to a different, the additional jail bookings and, and how many different arrests and everything else that are being made, one of the things that tends to get lost in general is the fact that those people end up in the court system. We have to handle them as well, the additional cases. And we need the facilities, safe and secure facilities to do that, and we need the judicial positions and the clerks to be able to handle those types of cases. 
in particular, when the excise tax was first introduced, the number one priority on the excise tax list was the new courthouse or the new Law and Justice Center. We have seen the county administration building leapfrog that. We've seen the sheriff's building leapfrog that. We've seen the jail leapfrog that. I'm not, just, not by any means degrading any of those projects. They were all necessary. However, it is to a point in time where we do need to focus our attention upon the Law and Justice Center. As a prime example, we have five clerks that work under unexposed sewer pipes in the old courthouse. That is just simply unacceptable. It is simply unacceptable. We have courtrooms that are an actual embarrassment. We have you know, counsel that come up from Phoenix and they come to the Bullhead courtroom and they marvel at the courtroom and ask why is it such that in Kingman we have the courtrooms that we have compared to the one that we have in Bullhead City. It is to the point of literally an embarrassment. So if we're going to turn around and effectively handle all of these additional people that are being booked into jail and being arrested, we're going to need to look at a new facility for uh, Kingman, for the county, as far as the courthouse is concerned. I'm not coming forward with any other additional requests with respect to the budget. Um, we're very thankful for uh, the process this year. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that the uh, supervisors have. Questions? Thank you Thank very you, much. <clears throat> Next I have on the list are constables. So if you would like to step up and in mass. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Our, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Supervisors, Mr. Timko, Mr. Ekstrom, and our County Administrator. Um, we want to follow in just with everybody else. Last year was my first year of going through the budget system, and it was a nightmare. So this year I've recruited my fellow constables to come and go through it with me. And uh, it was night and day from last year to this year. Um, things that we asked for this year, we have been approved. One of the things that we didn't, we a little bit talk about what our jobs are in each different office. We're all separate offices. Um, so when everything was said and done, we kind of compared what we'd all asked for and what we'd all received. And as you look at that, there's just two spots that's, that's pretty big. Our travel, which that's probably the majority of our job, is we get by, and we've got by each year, though, we've had to have a constable come and ask for a little more money into the budget outside of what they had originally had. And again, I think we're going to be right at the line again this year. We didn't get anything extra, so we're right at the line on, on our travel money. Um, and I guess we're kind of pushing this towards next year. I think we'll all live with that. But one of the things, like Havasu, he hasn't taken any money out of, tra out of travel since he's been doing it, pretty much. If we had another uh, constable take over that area at any point in time for any reason, if he resigned, if he quit, whatever, elections ended, um, that new constable would need money in their budget. So I don't think we should do a budget that doesn't have money available to run the office. At. Um, the second item in there that is, you'll see is the supplies and we all basically do the same thing. So our supplies should be fairly close to each other. Uh, there again, like Havasu's quite a bit off, and I don't know how he's doing his any cheaper than we are, unless he's paying for stuff out of his pocket and not getting reimbursed for it. So at this point, we're not really asking for more money in our budgets because I think we'll all survive with what we have, and if we need money, I guess we'll come back 
mid-year and ask for more money at that point in time, but looking towards the future, we want to equalize our office budgets a little better and, and plan a little more for the expenses that we actually are having to come up with. Any questions? Questions for you? Thank you so much. I right. Thank you, thank no you very much. I would suppose the <clears throat> next portion would put it to department heads. Is that? Mr. Chairman, uh, supervisors, we had uh, no department heads that uh, signed up to speak in front of the board. So if uh, it pleases the board, if you have any questions of specific departments, uh, we could uh, call them up individually and ask them questions like Supervisor Angus might have had a question regarding flood control and that could be addressed uh, on the personal issue that um, was, okay. okay. That's just a thought. <laughs> Don't look at me. Okay, there are no department heads. Already done that. Uh, if I could on one issue. Certainly, um, Supervisor Moss. Mr. Robinson's comments, if I can have an email sent to me describing the situation as it's understood on the county side of things. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Moss, absolutely. Thank you. Since this was, these things were said publicly, is there something you want to say? Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention from, from time to time, we have employees working out of class. And uh, those employees, or the department directors, can request uh, an, a, a classification compensation study if there are funds in that department that are available for such a study, um, uh, we don't actually have any control over where the, what that classification compensation study is going to show. Um, a classification compensation study was, requ was requested for um, the underfilled engineer, civil engineering position in flood control, and we received that, uh, those results from that classification compensation study from HR and that was included in your budget process. But it is a process that occurs within the county. We've talked about that, uh, um, uh, that uh, classification compensation studies for different employees uh, right here at the board uh, regarding, regarding risk management and, uh, and uh, um, O&B. It's, it's just a standard procedure. If we do have a, a person working under class, that's one remedy to correct that situation. Mr. Can Tom? I have Nick come up and address the specific Please. issue? Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Supervisors, I, I appreciate the opportunity, if I can say a few words, just add what Mike uh, said. Um, that uh, person, Shannon Summers, she was working out of class, and um, I take responsibility for that. It, uh, we've been talking about this in the past two years, that we need to reclassify her. Uh, and. Uh, what happened, it became very obvious uh, at, towards the end of last year. Um, she's been very active uh, with the county and statewide. And then uh, last year, the um, association of the Floodplain Management Association, which incorporates pretty much uh, most of the cities and counties throughout the state, and they send their floodplain administrators there. And the floodplain administrators have a chance to vote and uh, I was one of them voting for Mojave County, and they elected Shannon Summers as their chairman. You know, that, that uh, said a lot about uh, her working out of class, and if I may just say that, that uh, when I took over flood control as a part-time job, because flood control a district doesn't have a division manager right now, I'm filling in as in part-time, and I did that uh, when uh, flood control was part of uh, public works back about, uh, forgot exactly five years ago, and Mike asked me to uh, fill in and do it part-time. And at that time, flood control was doing pretty much permitting. That's all we did. And uh, so we had about 10 employees, and you know they issued floodplain permits. And then now we have about 11 employees without Mike and myself currently. And uh, we, we just do a tremendous amount of work. We saw the opportunity, 
And then we, we grew that program. And so we started doing design projects. We started doing construction projects, which was never done before. We started a, a channel maintenance program, which was never done before. And we're doing it very successfully. Uh, but, so I hired two engineers and thought that, oh, they're gonna grow the program. And they got really busy with the uh, channel uh, maintenance program and the design and the construction projects. And um, that's how we spent or spending down all that uh, surplus that we had. And then, but there was new FEMA maps uh, came out a few years ago. They were all messed up. So we started looking at uh, correcting the FEMA maps. We started doing new studies. So even FEMA looked at us and we were only, we were one of the two communities. I think City of Chandler was the only one that got FEMA grants in the past two years as a recognition of our, our great work with the floodplains. And uh, so we started pushing the envelope and uh, we, we did a community discovery program right now. We're meeting with all the uh, cities and Indian tribes and, and so forth and coordinating our flood effort because flood is not limited to one county or the other. And it's all FEMA granted. We got that all uh, as a recognition. Uh, the flood alert uh, warning system that used to be at the uh, road department and we took over that and increased it even more, very successful. Uh, we just talked about the community rating system today and uh, improving our GIS. Now, most of these programs were pushed by Shannon Summers. That's the fact. And again, uh, you know, in the past two years, I've been talking about that, oh, she's working out of class. And then we've been talking with HR, and then when she became president of AFMA, it became very obvious. So I went to HR, what should I do? And they told me, yeah, Nick, it's your fault, and I, I respect responsibility. And then they said, well, we need to reclassify. We need to create a position. So they created a new position. And uh, that process started a while ago. Ken Cunningham actually finished it. And I, uh, just about uh, a few weeks ago, I went, actually, I wanted to stop it. I, I was thinking about the budget process. I said, gosh, do we really have to do that? Uh, because that's gonna be a question. And then uh, they said it was done. So um, th this is what happened. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, she pushed the envelope. She, uh, she, she got us where, where we are. And then this re reclassification came from HR. I, I couldn't uh, not agree with that. So uh, thank you for the opportunity for sharing this with you. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to. Thank you, I have a question. Pleasure. Okay, Pleasure Mr. Hahn, is there ever a, a time when an employee is, uh, maybe they call it a lateral, <laughs> I'm not sure what the word is, but there, there are times when, when a position does not have to be open to the public, but there is a promotion within the department, is that correct? without having to be open to the public. Yes, uh, Supervisor Brotherton, and, and like Mike mentioned, it, that uh, the, this board discussed the uh, risk manager and then they discussed other positions, whether it should be reclassified. And that's the same reclassification process. And I'm not an HR expert. I, I go to HR and I ask them and they advise me and they told me that's the way to do it. And, and, and I follow their lead. Okay, well, that's, I do. I'm an advocate of promoting within, if we possibly can. So uh, we don't always have to open those uh, positions up to the public, but there is a promotion for maybe somebody's worked here for years and is very qualified and probably should be promoted into that position rather than hiring someone new. Right. Um, maybe that's and, just and my idea. In, in this case, uh, she, she was working out of class and she's been doing it for so long and not because I asked her to do it. She just pushed the envelope, kept doing it. She kept coming and said, can we start a new surveying system where, give you an idea, where you send out a survey crew and then do elevation surveys and then uh, you need like three people. And then can we install a system where we have only one person can do that? And last year we reward an award for that. And she pushed that system through. So how could I say no? And so she, she kept pushing the envelope and then she started working out of class. Now, to answer your question, typically when we fill positions, and, and that question came up, like the flood control district engineer. You know, it's a division head, I'm doing it part time, and, and now it's getting overwhelming. So we put that out, it's right now posted on the county webpage, anybody can apply. And of course, people that work in, in the county can apply too, because why should we, you know, penalize them not to? So, and then we're gonna select the best uh, qualified applicant for that. Okay, 
Thank you. I have no Any other to fire them off. I have a series of questions just to make sure I understand things. Um, this uh, indication going to the promotion, I'll call it a promotion, um, to floodplain manager, was, did I hear that was a four-step increase? Is that, did I hear that correctly, or was it some other number? He, yes, uh, Supervisor Moss, uh, Shannon uh, was a, uh, the position was in range 20, and it was uh, basically a, a non-registered engineer uh, range, which is uh, a fairly low range. The uh, registered engineer is range 22, and we have uh, two engineers there. And uh, going to, the, to this manager position, HR recommended uh, the uh, range 24. So that's what, uh, that's what uh, she was placed, and in the same steps. And then there's a position called, um, this is not the same issue, it's a different issue. Um, the district engineer, that's a currently vacant position? That is correct, yes. Um, and as I understand it, the proposal from flood control is to fill that position. Yes, uh, and uh, you know, we, we're doing so much with flood control and I'm not doing enough justice for them. I'm doing it part time. So mm -hmm. I, I asked, uh, I wanted to fill that position and right now it's being posted on the county webpage. That's, that's a range 26. We didn't change the uh, range on that. That's always been range 26. It was classified by the uh, uh, years ago when they did the salary study. Right, and, and by the way, just so you don't think I've noticed this on my own, I'm asking questions which have been asked of me and I'm trying to get answers publicly so that they responded to. Um, that position, there's a number of $41,474. Is that the total salary for the position or is that numbers above and, above, above and beyond the existing salary for that position? For the, for the district engineer a position, and I uh, just reading from my notes and my numbers are approximate, but I uh, know it's a range 26 uh, position, and the way we're advertising it, it's uh, range 26 is anywhere between 69,000 to 107,000. It's a division manager position, and I hope we can place the candidate, whoever we find, wherever this he or she belongs. Yeah. So I like to keep it open up to the uh, highest limit, the 107. So maybe uh, this is uh, something I can ask of um, uh, the county administrator or yourself, Mr. Hunt, if he thinks it's a better question. The $41,474, which is allocated to a just rate of pay for P number 1024 district engineer, um, that would be a pay increase for that position or would that be um, full funding for that position? May, may I answer that? Uh, Supervisor Russ, may, may I answer that? I, I oh, sure. was part of the budget process and I recommended that. Uh, I think uh, that's what I, my recollection is that the district manager position, he was sitting out there I think in uh, range 26 and I think it was like step five or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, because I think the last district uh, engineer, I don't know why, was it step five or six? I, I don't remember exactly where it was. but. So we, when we did the budget process, I said, well, let's put in the maximum limit. If we want to fill that position, just give us all the flexibility. And uh, you know, if we find a really good qualified person with tremendous experience, and then we we'll be able to put, place that person where, where uh, that person belongs. And that's the, uh, so there is a, we are proposing a pay increase stepwise for the district engineer position. There, there is, well. Yeah, may I answer that, Nick? Yes. Uh, and by the way, to be clear, I'm not judging oh. the good or bad business judgment. I'm just trying to clarify what's occurring on this line item here. Uh, the district engineer should be considered a department position. It's a non-classified position. Uh, what Nick's doing is trying, it's at the same range. Now there's 10 steps within that range. What Nick is trying to do is to provide himself the flexibility of being able to hire somebody based on their qualifications. If he's got a, an applicant that's extremely high qualified, like uh, uh, Mr. Moore was today. We were able to put him in as a, at a step six uh, as opposed to a one or two or three and wouldn't be able to hire him at that because of his qualifications. Uh, whatever is decided on a, a recommendation for hiring this individual, uh, we would be required to bring that back in front of the board for approval. No, no, I, 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 I don't doubt that at all. But I'm just trying to a, clarify It's that. not an increase. Well, uh, the range is the same. Uh, the individual that held the position a long time ago was a, if I recall, he wasn't holding that position permanently. He was a temporary assignment. Well, just so I can answer the question then, 
the 41474 which is budgeted for adjusting the rate of pay for the district engineer, that would be the maximum end of their salary? Or is that an increase in what was previously the maximum end of their, their salary? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, uh, there it, it, it must be a, a maximum to the salary because we aren't increasing the, the uh, uh, range at all on this particular position. Okay. So that would be basically what's budgeted to fill that position within the prior, at, or the prior district engineer's salary range. I see Mr. Timko thinks he can answer my question. <laughs> sure, maybe, I, maybe I can add some confusion to this. Uh -huh. What this does is put into the budget the high level salary of step 10 so that it gives them the opportunity to hire anywhere between one and 10 without having to change their budget. And the high end of step 10 it's is 41,474. Yes, Got it's it. a vacant position. We're just budgeting the high number instead of the last incumbent's number. Great, and you may provide the um, uh, a similar answer to my next question, which is there's a 31,595 adjusted rate of pay for civil engineer registered. Is that a filled position or unfilled position? Well, uh, tell you honestly, we, we're trying to create an additional civil engineer position okay. in flood control because the two civil engineers that uh, I have right now, they are fully loaded up and they are struggling uh, maintaining and you know design and and construction projects and the alert system we want to bring it to a, a even higher level so I'm thinking about on that position you know that will justify another civil engineer here within the budget here and I'm not saying doing it right away and I just put it in the budget to have that ability uh, once it's approved then we can hire and that would be probably a lower level salary range somebody who, who um, you know uh, has a few years experience and and can bring the alert system a higher level and we can take on more projects and when it comes to that budget item of 31,595 for a civil engineer registered is that a pay increase or is that filling a new position or creating the budget capacity to fill a new position uh, mr. chairman supervisor Moss that that would be the exact same explanation John provided so. to the previous. So it's an empty position, but we're creating the capacity in order to hire a body to put into that role. Yes, sir. Got it. Thank you. That's all the hard questions I have for flood control. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other presentations? Mr. Demko. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Uh, just spend a couple minutes talking about the remainder of the process. Uh, today we've had the, the uh, budget workshop. Um, we have uh, still some, uh, some undecided uh, issues in the budget, uh, specifically things that need to occur at the state level for us to know, our, um, our change in our access all tax costs from the state, whether or not we're going to get the revenue from the lottery. Um, we also have um, presumably new initiatives uh, that are, are presented here. Uh, none of the board members, have, other than what which we've just discussed, um, no problem with those. So those will be rolled into the de actual department budgets between now and the presentation to you of the tentative budget. Uh, I will tell you that the tentative budget is, is important uh, in as much as uh, statutorily what you approve as the tentative budget, which then gets published in the newspaper, sets an upper limit for the amount the county can spend during fiscal 14. Uh, I will tell you that in the past we have always put just an additional million dollars of revenue and million dollars of expenditures that we don't have any knowledge where the revenue is coming from or what the expenditures will be on just to give us flexibility for anything that happens between the tentative and the final that we can use that buffer to accomplish those in our final budget as well. So that will be coming in the tentative budget. Uh, we expect to have that to you uh, a week or so be have, before you have to vote on it. And uh, if there are still unanswered items uh, from the state budget, which is not unheard of, uh, they've frequently gone into mid-July uh, before settling their budget finally. Uh, and since the access all tax number is, is such an, uh, a large number in our budget, uh, we, will, we will hedge significantly uh, against that number as well. Um, 
any other questions on the remainder of the process, I'd be happy to answer. Well, this isn't so much a process issue, it's just general questions. If this is the proper time, Absolutely. I'll throw them out there. Certainly. Um, I, I thought I heard this in your early, early, your introductory remarks, Mr. Timko. I just wanted to clarify the property tax collections for next year. Do we have an idea as to how they're going to compare to this year? Are they going up or down? Well, the, the levy for FY14 will be lower by some $371,000, presuming that we leave the levy rate at its current 1.8196. The collections of that are something that we try desperately to guess well at. <laughs> uh, just because we levy uh, property taxes doesn't necessarily mean that they get paid in the year that they are levied. I would point out that those that do not get paid in the year of levy most often also don't get paid in the following year, but two years out, just before the tax lien sale, a lot of those get brought current. And quite frankly, a lot of those uh, are instances where it's a bank foreclosure. The bank's not going to pay that property tax until just before the tax lien sale when they have an opportunity to lose the property if they don't. And so uh, our two-year delinquent tax revenues are increasing uh, as our primary levy is decreasing. And uh, so we factor that in as well. So um, when it comes to the amount that was levied this year as compared to what's going to be levied next year, there is going to be a reduction of approximately how much? Well, I can't give you in dollars, I can give you in percent. 100% um, of our levy last year, uh, we budgeted collecting 95% of that levy. It looks like we're only going to collect about 93 to 94%. Okay. Do we have an understanding? I think I thought you saw a set a dollar figure a little earlier, and perhaps I'm using the wrong phraseology. But um, was is there going to be a decrease in the gross amount that we're entitled to collect next year as compared to this year? The answer is yes, and as far as the current year levy. Because our evaluation went down, if we leave the levy rate at the same number, it will generate 371000 less appearing on tax bills for, for this year. This year we were saved, um, I think, because the sales increases, the automobiles or the, the what was that category of, exp uh, of taxation which saved us? The state church sales tax is increasing. The, right. the retail revenues uh, in the county and in the state, which we share, uh, are increasing and have allowed us to, uh, to budget a, uh, an increase in that line item. Uh, however, the uh, vehicle sales, specifically right. the vehicle license tax, uh, is coming substantially under what we budgeted in the current year, and so I budgeted no increase for next year. Okay. So um, do we anticipate having the increased sales collections, um, the shared revenues from the state this coming year to deal with that prospective decrease in the levied um, uh, property taxes? Yes, sir. Those, some go up, some go down, and right. in total we're going down about a $1.1 million. Okay, and it's going down $1.1 million in the sales tax shared revenues? Oh, in total revenues for the In county. total revenues. Oh, okay. So... Um, the anticipation is not for this year, but this next year, we're going to take a $1.1 million hit. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, the, the FY14 budget will, will rely on $1.1 million less revenue okay. than we did in FY13. Uh, the, the reason I'm asking this is I'm looking at the expenses, for example, the 2.5% pay increase. And so can we commit to something year in and year out if we're going to, if we're anticipating and we're aware of potential decreases in income streams coming into, like called fiscal year 2015, um, so what have we done in order to account for that possibility? It's like it's great to say here's a 2.5 percent pay increase, but if we're not ready to deal with that year in and year out, the following year we're going to say here's your 10 furlough days. <laughs> so it's I understand. what what have we done to, in order to make sure that we stay in flux. Okay, I understand your question now. Right. Um, right. The primary resource for the uh, for the 2.5 percent cost of living increase has been the fact that in the current year's budget uh, we uh, we funded the pay the early payoff of this building. This building we had been uh, 
as much as $2 million a year uh, in the past, putting money into a debt service reserve account so that we could pay this off early and save the interest. And so that was consistently um, a consistent expense over the past several years that because we've now reached that, uh, that payoff level, we can stop doing. And so that's a million two to a million four uh, per year next year and the year after that and the year after that that uh, is available to, uh, to support the pay raise on an ongoing basis. So we're Thank using you. ongoing revenues, not one-time reductions. For example, if, Thank you. if this year we had done a sweep of, of a million two to afford the raise, next year we would have had a significant problem yeah. <laughs> because we wouldn't have had that sweep opportunity again. And I understand that. And, and, and thank you for that because that's where I was trying to get to. So this 2.5% pay increase is budgeted year in and year out based upon prior expenses, yes. one expense to pay off of this building having gone away, and we're just going to continue going forward and use that revenue stream to fund the pay increase. That's correct. It, it's sustainable. Right. What, and have you built in the deficiencies, the anticipated deficiencies in 2015's real property taxes shortfall, is that also going to cover, that income stream going to cover the, um, the pay increase plus that real property tax decrease? In, in point of fact, as it relates to property tax in the future years, we anticipate that FY15 will in fact have an increase in assessed valuation. Uh, the assessors reported that to us, that, that he's seeing that now, but it doesn't what he's seeing now doesn't affect us until FY15. There's a two-year turnaround. Exactly. Right. And so uh, that occurred uh, last year and is continuing to, uh, to accrue this year. And so we have great expectations that the, uh, the FY15 uh, assessed valuations will turn that four-year decrease into a uh, uh, turn the corner on that and show us an increase. And I'm, I'm going to keep asking questions because I think I know some of these answers, but I want to make sure they're out there. Um, when it comes to the county's contingency, um, we're going to go into this budget year with a $10 million, $11 million in that range contingency in case we encounter unexpected expenses. Is that my, is my understanding on that correct? That's correct. It may be as high as 12, depending okay. on how we finish this fiscal year. Right. And um, the prior year we had a $20 million contingency, but that was decreased to 10 this coming year, primarily because uh, we were doing the early payoff of the buildings. That's correct, sir. Can I add just one thing to that? Sure. Then the 20 million was total contingency. Yes. Okay. And, and the well, 10 general, million general is general fund. Yes. One more thing. And for the record, there's no, there's no early, there's no early payment penalty for, for these uh, payoffs. There's actually a 1% premium that we pay on the outstanding principal when we, uh, when we defeat the debt. Uh, that's offset by we've got about a four and a half percent interest rate go moving forward if we don't do an early pay off. Okay. I have a comment. Okay. Supervisor Brotherton, you have the floor. Okay. Besides the explanation that Mr. Timko have, has given you, because of my prior uh, business, I happen to know that he has been very conservative in uh, projecting are what we're going to collect in taxes because I just recently was out looking for three repos, foreclosed properties for an individual, and I just couldn't find any within that. They're selling as fast as they come on the market, and they're selling for way more. I had estimated a mobile out in my area on an acre that probably was going to sell for about 50000 at the very top end. Now they came out and have listed it for 150000 mm. Now, it may not sell for that, but that is what the people that are actually in the business, this is what they're thinking and feeling. Uh, I think that that he's really being conservative in his estimation. I think most of those foreclosures have sold and will be sold, and somebody will be paying mm -hmm. taxes on them. Yeah. So uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, besides that, and I don't see the assessor here today, but the other day when I was talking with him, is he here? Oh, no, oh well, yes. 
Hi. I, you don't look like Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but I was talking to Ron the other day, and he says, you know, I really need more help because this place is about to blow wide open. And so I take his word for it, and I feel that way too. I, I think that we really are uh, I, on the upward swing. I have the utmost confidence in Mr. Um, Tim Coe's financial abilities. <laughs> so it's, I just want to make sure that these answers are out there and they're public. Um, can we ask uh, Ron Substitute <laughs> to come down so we can ask him this question about our property tax revenues? going on in four years. The reason I'm doing this, I'm very hesitant to vote for a recurring every year in out expense unless we're 100% confident that we can afford to pay it year in and year out. And so um, if the, uh, sir, I'll confess, I forget your name. I know Mr. Fielder, Ken Mr. Fielder. Fielder. Mr. Fielder. Mr. Perry. I didn't yeah. know who you were talking <laughs> And welcome, Ken. Thank you, Supervisor Watson, Supervisor Moss. What's your question, sir? Um, I apologize for my voice. When it comes to the um, uh, property tax valuations that we'll be receiving, um, not this current year, but the following year, the 2014-2015 um, budget cycle, Which, is the assessor anticipating an increase in revenue to the county from those valuations? Yes, Supervisor, we are seeing an increase. And uh, they've, we have the opportunity in September with a supplemental September notice process to add some additions to the 14 tax roll, but certainly the 15 tax roll is showing an increase. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, you Kim. Any further questions? Uh, Mr. Moss, I, I would also point out that we have dealt with shortfalls in the past uh, during my uh, tenure in this office. And uh, we can deal with those pretty effectively in, um, in using the hiring freeze. Um, and so it, it doesn't require us to do layoffs. It doesn't require us to do furloughs. But when a position empties, we can leave it open longer and generate savings there to offset shortfalls in, in anticipated revenue. So in the event the board approves the 2.5% pay increase for county employees, um, we would have mechanisms to adjust short of furlough days and riffing employees um, to cover that shortfall. Yes, sir, we do. I have one other um, question, um, and I know the answer because I've talked to Mike about it, but I want to engage it in public discourse, is have we budgeted any assistance to our social service agencies? I believe we had interagency up here a little while ago. Sarah's House has been one of those um, entities which has done a lot of community good. Have we done anything in that regard with, uh, in this budget year? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, no, we have not. Uh, with one small caveat, uh, we, we began a process uh, many years ago, um, but during my duration, so within the past 10 years, uh, there was a, uh, a request and the board at that time approved um, a uh, $2,200 per supervisor um, discretionary right. social service assistance. Right. Uh, typically, that had been um, given to nonprofits during uh, during Christmas time or Thanksgiving time to uh, to assist food banks. Right. When it comes to other than that small amount, but this just to be clear, this budget year, the proposed budget includes nothing for the more substantive substantive, the more expansive aid to social services the groups that provide for our less fortunate citizens in our community. With the possible exception of some of the programs that are operated in community, uh, in Susie's area. Right, Where right. obviously they're, they're programs that we pass through, but as far as general fund, um, uh, general fund revenues uh, being dispersed, no. Okay. Thank you. By the way, congratulations, you did a very good job putting this proposed budget together. I, Supervisor Brotherton. Okay. I just have a comment to department heads and, and our employees in general. Um, I know that we have a problem now because there haven't been any raises in so long that many times people that have been here for, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years, um, they experience someone coming in new off the street that are hired at a higher rate of pay than they are. 
And I don't know what we can do to maybe eliminate that or alleviate that, but I really do think as department heads or uh, however we can, take a look at that and try to make this a, a little more fair. Because many times we'll say, well, this person is more qualified than this person that's been here. But I think the number of years that they've spent on that particular job really speaks loudly of their qualifications. They've been trained in that and on that for years and years, so I really believe that perhaps their qualifications are even above somebody whose actual school time is a little more than theirs. So if we could do something to, to maybe alleviate that, uh, I, I would sure like to see that happen. And then, because we have so many people saying, she's only been here two years, and she's making more than I have, and I've been here seven years. You know, it, it's, it, I, I do hate to see that, and I don't, I don't like to see the employees feel that way. And one of the things that I campaigned on and that I mentioned over and over and over again when I was campaigning is I want to see the employees have a raise. They haven't had one in so long, and, and I really would like to see this level off and people to feel more secure in their position. I think that makes uh, for a lot of insecurity uh, for somebody to be here for so long and then have somebody uh, brand new come along and make more money than they do. So if there's anything we can do, if there's anything that I can help uh, do or figure out, I'd be willing to, to do that because I really would like to see it. Well, that segues yeah. into, into kind of my question, which was I was, kind of, I, was I thought I, uh, was led to believe that with this coal imp increase, it would n it would be people who've been here for a year or longer, and that would take care of some of Supervisor Brotherton's uh, aims, and uh, they would have to have reached a certain review uh, stature. Is that true? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Angus, um, we may have confused you. Um, we were talking. We talked at uh, various times three different. Uh, methods of giving employees a raise. One would be a one-time lump sum, the other would be a merit-based increase, and the other would be the COLA. Uh, the COLA uh, applies to all employees and actually um, would avoid uh, penalizing those long-term employees who are at the top of their range. With a COLA, a cost of living increase, we move the whole range 2.5%. So we increase the top, we increase the bottom, we increase everybody in between, and that's what we're proposing. Okay, so if John Doe is here for two months, he'll get a raise. Jane Smith for ten years, they're they'll, both going to they'll get both get a two and a half percent raise. That doesn't do anything to rectify. But that would not would not take somebody coming in the door tomorrow and make them be paid any higher than than somebody that was here for one year or five years or ten years. Everybody would get that increase, and the starting salary would also increase two point five percent. As, as the, uh, I think, the largest uh, employer in the county, uh, notwithstanding testimony we heard this morning's meeting, uh, I think the county's up there with the hospital as well, uh, with our employment. Um, what we do in the community with our payroll is, is a, a tremendous impact on the economic uh, activity uh, within the county. And so uh, doing this, uh, not only uh, not only benefits our employees, but it benefits the shopkeepers and storekeepers who our employees spend their money with, and uh, so it's a benefit to the entire county. If I could for a moment, my Republican so principles are screaming in agony here. Um, we take, we pay for that 2.5% increase, which would help the shopkeepers and employees. We take the, that money to pay those people from the homeowners and the business people. So they're, we're giving on one end and we're squeezing them on the other. So it's not a net gain at all. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Moss. Uh, Supervisor Angus, did you have a comment? I'm done. So, uh, Mr. Hendricks, I know you have a comment. Uh, yes, I did. There was a, uh, you know, our presiding judge made an extremely valid point, and so did the sheriff, that uh, if we have long term employees, we shouldn't necessarily penalize those long-term employees. And those long-term employees are more than likely uh, or have a good potential to be at the top of the, the salary range. However, I, I certainly respect Supervisor Angus's comment that if we have an employee that's doing substandard, you know, uh, possibly that employee shouldn't be rewarded with a raise. Uh, the decision on, on what's going to be 
actually presented to the board in, in relation to what type of raise is going to be presented hasn't necessarily been finalized. And John and I have talked about it and discussed uh, potentials with the different elected officials and with you all on what you'd like to see. So um, the raise, uh, we've talked about what a pure COLA would look like and it would be a raise for everybody or what a combination may look like that would be a part COLA and part merit increase. So we'll try to uh, get a better feel for what the board would like to see and come up with uh, hopefully something that, that uh, uh, is uh, acceptable to all all the board members and, and if, have that presented with the budget if I could thank you mr. Hendricks yes. Supervisor Moss. thank you mr. chairman um, I think I've mentioned this to you before but I'll mention it to workshop this is about giving and taking ideas when it comes to the property tax revenue and I believe the, the assessor's office mr. fielder and um, Ron Nicholson do an outstanding job um, as does mr. Timco I I get the I have the fear that we're doing a little bit of counting of, of, uh, of two birds in the bush as opposed to the one bird in the hand because we're anticipating more revenues, not this, this year, but next, which means that uh, when it comes to whether we have more or less revenue, whether we're going to be running on skin and bones and all the rest of it, I just prefer the concept of having a one-time lump sum, I'll call it a bonus, and then when we actually do have the line of credit paid off and we do realize that um, income stream and we do have the increase in property tax revenues and we are looking at many millions of additional excess income that we can allocate either the real property tax deduction or pay increases to employees and the various other things that we should be not jumping too quickly. Honor them, acknowledge their commitment, create a formula along the line what Supervisor Angus was suggesting and then give them some amount of money um, to show that we do, we do value you and here's the dollars that you can hopefully go spend at our local merchants without committing ourselves year in and year out to a permanent COLA increase. I just feel like if I hadn't had a raise in seven or eight years, a one-time small little lump sum just wouldn't cut it as far as I'm concerned. I just but am I Supervisor Angus, oh, would I'm you? Sorry. Yeah, but as I understand what Supervisor Moss is saying, he's, he's saying then we'll just revisit it next year when we have the information and, the and money. then we can even maybe even do more based on all this money that we're being told is coming in. We haven't really anticipated more money coming in. Well, we really haven't. We've made provision <laughs> that's what, for that. Well, that's what, that's what, what, what Supervisor Moss's concern is. That, we haven't, though. Right. Well, that's the concern. For the future but if we haven't anticipated more income then what's the concern we can make it on what we have right now what? even if there is no more income and we're not taxing the people anymore so it's not costing them anymore but it's certainly going to make a difference for our employees and i'm not saying that we take away that economic benefit on the discussion i'm saying we give it to them without committing ourselves to year two until we see what year two is like so we're not saying not give them the money I'm not saying that uh, I'm saying here's the money we'll see whether or not we can make it permanent or more recurring or whatever next year when we actually see the decrease in debt when we actually see um, the increased collection of property tax revenues that was my comment uh, Supervisor Johnson do you have anything that you may want to add or Do you have me now? What? Uh, pardon me? Am I on now? Yes, you are on. Okay, I, I agree with uh, Supervisor Moss's take. This is the first year we've got a, uh, a surplus because of paying off the uh, buildings, and that freed up some of the general fund money. I, I believe that, you know, the public and, and our employees are all paying the property tax and, and the other taxes that fund our county. And the general public has not been getting pay increases. I think it sets a bad example for us to make a pay increase. Uh, I believe that two and a half percent, our employees aren't even going to spit in a paycheck. I think that uh, another option that you might consider would be it's something I've brought up in the past is if we make it available that employees who they have an awful lot of save time now. And we have to either give them the time off anyway, so why don't we 
say we will fund for a year. So say next year, if you've maxed out your time, we will buy that time from you uh, so you can afford to make a house payment, do whatever you want to do. It doesn't really affect the budget at all, and we go a year to see how that $1.2 million is to uh, hold on. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. Mr. Chairman, if I might. Uh, Mr. Timko. I, I would just point out to the, to the board that staff can accommodate uh, any methodology that you prefer. I would point out that the most expensive of the methodologies would be the COLA. That much is accounted for. Anything you would do differently than that would be less, and so the budget would, uh, would be able to accommodate any choice that you select. Thank you, Mr. Timko. Well, at this point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for your participation and everyone's eagerness to succeed into next year. Uh, also, I'd like to remind you that if you have any ideas on improving our process, please feel free to not only give them to me, but also the other supervisors or your uh, department heads. Thank you very much. It certainly has been a pleasure. Sure.